Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Megalodon. I am starting this list off with my favorite prehistoric sea monster, the infamous Megalodon. Megalodons are one of the largest sharks to have ever existed. They were huge, they were terrifying, they were apex predators, and they are the creatures that inspired the tales of Jaws, or the Meg. The teeth on these sharks are so large that they are three times larger than the teeth of a modern great white shark. With teeth that size, you can only imagine how large this shark would have been. It's pretty tough to figure out exactly why the Megalodon died out. I mean, they were one of the largest, scariest creatures who shouldn't have had any trouble getting food, but that might not be the case. Some believe it was the cooling water, others believe it was competition for food. Whatever the case in the end, while the Megalodon is an incredible creature in history, I think we can all breathe a sigh of relief that they aren't swimming around our oceans anymore. In our number nine spot today, we have the Plesiosaurus. These guys are a prehistoric creature that was massive and grew to be about 43 feet long. They had these super long necks that basically took up like half of their body and even though they were so massive, they had no trouble moving efficiently through the water. These creatures had four flippers so our best guess as to how they swam would be sort of like a penguin. Their front limbs did most of the work while the back ones kind of took hold of the steering. Fossils have been able to show us that these creatures gave birth to live young and are actually kind of similar to dolphins in the way that they take care of their young. It is thought that these just may be the creatures that inspired the tales of the Loch Ness Monster. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Basilosaurus. These guys have a name that translates to King Lizard, and they are a genus of large, predatory, prehistoric whales that lived during the Eocene, which was approximately 41.3 to 33.9 million years ago. These guys were actually first described in 1834, which makes them the first prehistoric whale known to science. These guys were one of the largest, if not the largest, of their time, and they were the top predators of their environment. They they preyed on sharks, large fish, other marine animals, including the dolphin like Darudon. Really, they were able to eat basically anything that they felt like. These guys even had teeth that were various types, like canines and molars, which probably allowed these creatures to chew their food, which is different to their more modern ancestors. In our number seven spot today, we have the Pliosaurus, another massive prehistoric creature. Also, not to be confused with the Plesiosaurus, I was confused in the beginning. These guys grew to be around 40 feet long and about the size of some of the whales that we would see today. These creatures are best known for their insane hunting abilities. They could move quickly and were quite strong. This effective predator skill set, coupled with their massive size, allowed them the ability to take down much larger prey, sometimes even dinosaurs. According to experts, these guys had exceptionally strong jaws. Some even believe that it might have had a bite just as powerful as a T-Rex, which is of course known for having one of the most powerful bites of any land animal. I'm just saying, these guys were definitely a top predator in their day. In our number six spot today, we have the Jacolopterus. Okay. I've got three words for you. Giant sea scorpion. Yeah, remind me to never go into the prehistoric ocean. This eight foot long arthropod lived in the water with its gross two large pincers and claws and honestly it looks like something out of the movie Alien. These guys had segmented bodies and they're actually the largest known arthropod to have ever existed here on earth. They had multiple specialized limbs and some of them even had spikes. Like for example, their 18 inch spiked claw that was used to snatch fish that passed by. It is said that some of these guys would crawl out of the water in order to mate and sometimes shed their outer skin, and all I have to say is imagine finding an eight foot long molt of one of these creatures on the beach right before you jump in for a swim. You wouldn't, right? I'd swear off all water after that. In our number five spot today, we have the Helicoprion. Okay, listen, there are many problems with our modern world. We could sit here all day talking about them. We could even go into next week, there are so many. But here's the thing we need to realize. Things could be so much worse, and by worse, I mean that this creature could still exist. This animal existed somewhere around 250 million years ago, and while it looks more like a shark than anything else, scientists now know that it was actually a creature that is related more closely to chimeras, which are a fish that separated from the shark family about 400 million years ago. So why is this animal so scary and just terrible to look at? Well, that is due to the incredibly unsettling spiral saw formation of teeth that this creature had right on their lower jaw. 
jaw. Yeah, an orthodontist's dream, truly. It's also not like this creature was just born with the teeth that they had for the rest of their lives. No, of course not. They had teeth that could grow and new teeth could even form. Imagine being in the ocean and you see a huge creature swim up to you that has four spiral saws for teeth. Yeah, no thanks. In our number four spot today, we have the Mosasaurus. During the Cretaceous period, which spanned about 145.5 to 65.5 million years ago, there was this genus of reptiles called Mosasaurus. These guys were absolutely huge aquatic reptiles that roamed throughout the waterways here on Earth. Because of their size, they became apex predators during this time, and they have been estimated to have grown to about 56 feet. At the time of their existence, it isn't exactly likely that they would have encountered any sharks that are alarmingly large like the Megalodon was, but I mean the Cretaceous period certainly had some other massive creatures that put up some pretty stiff competition. This is of course, like I mentioned, an entire genus, so there are definitely some less threatening species in the mix, but there are some in there who would have given the Meg a run for their money should they have existed at the same time. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Leviathan. If we were to look at our ocean today, we of course would see sharks as one of the top predators that exist. I mean, some sharks are huge, and they certainly know how to hunt, but they aren't the only scary creatures roaming the oceans. Sometimes killer whales make such a grand appearance that they even scare off some of the most terrifying sharks and make them flee for incredible distances. This is something that was also seen many, many, many years ago, I mean millions of years ago during the time of the Megalodon, and that is thanks to this gigantic creature known as the Leviathan. If you are unfamiliar, this is a now extinct genus of macroraptorial sperm whale. It is believed that they could weigh around 100,000 pounds and reach up to 57 feet in length, and it's thought that their size is what helped repel other predators while also helping them become the predator themselves. The Leviathan also had enormous teeth, teeth that reached over a foot in length, which is what gave them the title of largest bite of any tetrapod. In our number two spot today, we have the Chronosaurus. This Cretaceous marine reptile is one that had an elongated head, a short neck, and a stiff body that was propelled by not just one, but two sets of fins that helped it get through the water and through strong currents in order to capture whatever prey it was after. These guys were somewhere around 30 to 40 feet in length, and they had many, many long, sharp conical teeth, with some of them being enlarged to be fangs. So yeah, I mean, what more could you want from a terrifying sea creature? Along with the fossils found of these guys, experts have been able to determine some of the stuff they ate, and it includes turtles, as well as other pliosaurs, which these guys are a part of that genus, meaning they basically ate their own family. In our number one spot today, we have the Mausaurus. These guys are a creature that was once very real, but thankfully are a relic of our past because they are absolutely horrifying. They are named after the Maori god Maui, who is said to have pulled the islands of New Zealand up from the sea floor, so anything named after him is of course going to be an absolute ginormous beast. The neck of this creature measured around 49 feet long, which is the longest proportionate neck of any animal. The entire creature is measured around 66 feet, so it is clear that their neck counted for quite a large portion of their body. But like, imagine a swimming dinosaur creature with a huge snake for a neck. That's kind of what these guys were like. These guys lived on Earth during the Cretaceous period, which is good news for us, but not so much for the creatures that lived at the time. Creatures would jump into the water to avoid a T-Rex, only to find this guy waiting for them. Yeah, mm mm, no thanks. Number 10, the Antikythera device. I think I said that right. The Antikythera mechanism or device, I mean, this sounds like something straight out of Call of Duty Zombies, but the discovery comes to us straight from the magical land of antiquity, the land of marble, democracy, and olive oil. Very nice, beautiful. It's more Italian than Greek, but okay, we're gonna go with it. In 1901, Greek divers found a shipwreck not too far from the island of Antikythera. Naturally, they looked in to see what was inside. Remnants of cargo included pottery, coins, jewels, and a strange gear like device. Later, it was dubbed the Antikythera device. It was also later discovered to be that of a very early analog computer. Ooh. It was a fancy way of saying a basic or manual power computer that calculates simple solutions or that of a singular solution. It might not sound like much, but to me, it's a very unique find. Sure, this machine was simple, but it makes us wonder what else may have been lost to time. It's thought to have been used as an astrological calendar, aiding the user in mapping out where the sun and moon will be on different dates. Pretty cool. Pretty, I don't know how 
do they do that though? That's, you know what I mean? Like, how do they think of that? I couldn't even think of that. I'm a modern guy. Jeez. Number nine, purple orb. I've been around for a little while now, and in my scientific research, I've seen my fair share of orbs. You got Goku's Kamehameha, you got the orbs in Mario Party. Heck, I've chased so many orbs in Call of Duty Zombies, I've lost count. The point I'm making here is I know an orb when I see an orb. I know one when I see one. The purple orb found in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean floor, not too far from the California coast. Well, frankly, I have no idea what this is, said also the scientist who discovered it in 2016 while exploring the ocean floor. Scientists discovered a purple spherical blob, aptly named Blobus purpleus. You, you can't get better than that, folks. Naturally, using a very high-tech device called a vacuum, we suck that bad boy up like a farmer gets sucked up in a UFO in the middle of a cornfield in Arkansas. For further analysis, of course, what else? The verdict? Eh, we ain't too sure yet. It could be some form of sea slug, but if that's the case, it's the first purple one ever caught, showing that if you look hard enough, you can find shiny Pokemon too. <laughs> Number eight, the Megalodon. This one goes out to all the people who went to see a movie called Jaws in the 70s and had no idea what they were in for. I can only imagine what kind of pants soiling experience that must have been. For our younger audience to understand, there just wasn't any movie like Jaws around back then. It was pretty unique. A summer blockbuster and it changed film forever, honestly. It also made people think twice about going into deep water at the beach. You never know, I know this is, that was a movie, but you, you never know, <laughs> said people. Well. What if I told you Jaws weren't too far from the truth? Yes, that's right, folks. Fossils have been found dating back to 20 million years ago, and these fossils belong to that of the mega shark. The Megalodon. A great white shark is anywhere between four and a half meters to around eight meters at the most. The Meg, as she's commonly called, she's estimated to be around 17 meters. That's over 50 feet in American, folks. That's that, that's a big fish, man. While a full fossil has never been found, teeth and some bone paint an image of a very beastly fish. Not what I want to cross. I don't. I just stay out of the water. I like water, but I like swimming pools, chlorine. I'd rather swim and pee than with sharks. Okay, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm. That's what I'm here to tell you, folks. Number seven, the city of Bai. Okay, so. No, Romans, right? I mean, no one does it like the Romans do. Gold, marble, parties. When they sent it, buddy, it was full scent. Well, what if I told you that the Romans had a Las Vegas? Eh, well, sort of. Obviously, there wasn't a majestic city in the middle of the desert with slot machines, line dancers, and Elvis Presley, but both cities were both built by corrupt Italian leaders. Oh, look at that. Some of these guys wore armor, and the others wore suits, so it, yeah, kind of makes sense. The city of Bailly was a resort town in the modern sense. A lot of Roman emperors, politicians owned villas there, which attracted other wealthy folks. Kind of like Las Vegas. Despite even Caesar himself owning property here, the city now unfortunately rests under the water, where you can find remnants of Roman activity, fragments of street, pottery, statues, coins, the works. It's not every day you get to visit a Roman resort underwater. It's located in the Mediterranean Sea, just west of the Italian coast. It's close enough to the ocean for me. Close enough, I think it counts, it's pretty cool. Number six, Pavla Petri. Similar to Bailly, but on a much more discovered on accident kind of deal. In 1967, a man named Nicholas Fleming was snorkeling in the area and well, just so happened to see some weird stuff that he thought resembled a street. Naturally, when he got out of the water and told everybody, no one believed him. Said, yeah, right, you're not telling the truth yet. It's not true, you're not, no. But after the area was mapped out in 1968, well, it turns out he was telling the truth. Here was the sunken city of Pablo Petri. What they found there was surprising. There were streets, grids, and foundations of buildings remaining, even a small staircase. With all this evidence present, it's speculated that earthquakes around 1000 BCE are what sunk the city. However, what's most What's interesting is that it's speculated they were there from around 2800 BCE. So they're there for a long time, and the earthquake took them out. Kind of cool. The earthquakes are not cool, but the story is cool. Number five, the goblin shark. This animal is why I would hate being a scientist, but also would make for great TV. I get scared easily. It'd be kind of cool. Imagine there was a shark, but Mother Nature wasn't completely sold on the design. Okay, sure, it's fast and lethal and naturally blends into the waters to make an apex predator, but it, it just needs something more, Mother Nature said. Oh, I know. Let's add nail-like teeth and an extendable jaw. Oh, and, and a Jedi sixth sense. Yeah. That sounds right. Yes, that is right. The goblin sharks are the weird distant cousin of the shark. They live at the bottom of the ocean floor and eat pretty much whatever they can find down there. They hunt in darkness using their elongated snout that has literally a spider sense when something gets close to it and a jaw that extends to help them grab food. It's like having Commando Pro from 
MW2, if anyone remembers that. Remember that one? That was hard. That was a tough perk, man. It got in the way of a lot of things. It just goes to show that there's a lot of weird things at the bottom of the ocean. And it, it really, I, I, we, I wouldn't be surprised if we find some more weird stuff down there. It's gonna happen one day. Number four, shipwreck of the San Jose. San Jose was part of the Spanish treasure fleet in the early 1700s, which in case you didn't know, was basically big boats for carrying all their loot and booty back to Spain. These ships were filled with everything of value. Spices, tobacco, booze, silver, gems, metals, and most importantly, gold. Oh yes. I mean, that was the reason why they were there. She sank in 1708, but not too far from Colombia. She was eventually found by the Colombian Navy and has since been guarded as a state secret. Hmm, I wonder why. Hmm. The estimated value of the loot inside the ship's hull is to be worth around $15 billion US. Wow, that's a lot of money. Number three, the big squid. This one is simple. In the last couple years, both unmanned expeditions and cameras attached to deep sea drilling rigs have caught footage of giant squids. This is impressive for two reasons. One, their size. I mean, these guys are massive and well, two, because of their elusive nature and the fact they live really far down in the ocean, we just don't know that much about them and or have that much footage on them. So we take anything we can get. The largest squid on record from head to, uh, well, tentacle or appendage, whatever you want to call it, measured in at a whopping 43 feet. That's a big, that's a, that's a big squid, man. It's almost hard to imagine creatures living that far down there that big. It's a good thing it's difficult for us to get down there. Not that I have any interest going down there, it's just, you know, it's... I'm not so scared. I'm not scared. I'm scared. I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared. Number two, anglerfish. Here's another horror from the depths of the ocean. Folks around my age may recall the anglerfish from the terrifying moment in the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Movies and media is how I relate to things. Just Trust me. Remember the part with the ice cream? Remember he's got the ice cream and he's eating them? Remember that part? Yeah, it's weird. Anglerfish are best known for their third appendage that in some anglerfish possess the ability of bioluminescence or like a fluffy antenna that kind of just hangs off the forehead. What's the reason for this decorative dancey bit? Well, it's to lure in food. Uh, like a fishing lure but that we would use. Kind of cool. That's when it strikes with its razor sharp teeth and the most awful surprise attack ever from probably one of the most, if not the ugliest fish out of the ocean. Number one, crop circles. Most crop circles that you find are found in cornfields in middle America, where people claim that little green men came to visit them in the middle of the night. I swear it's by. Well, as some divers discovered in 1995, there were crop circles at the bottom of the ocean, but what could make those? Aliens? No one knew what was causing them. Well, it turns out that in 2011, the mystery was solved. It was actually a cute pufferfish, or I say one. It was actually a species of cute pufferfish that were making art on the ocean floor with their fins in hopes of recruiting a mate. It's a good thing I don't have to use art because I was never good at trying. It wouldn't go very well. Good thing I got cute little blue eyes. Oh my goodness. Number 10, Roman sea curses. Okay, the first century, a great place to begin with most things that are horrible and new to humans. Romans did things a little differently. We can't figure out yet how they engineered aqueducts or how that many people watch Colosseum battles. Yeah, I can't watch an arm bar during UFC, let alone bring my family to the Coliseum. Be like, that's a lion. That's a, that's a guy getting eaten by the lion. Yeah, it's him. Ancient Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, he wrote a book on natural history. And in said book, this go-to, might I add, on ancient history, the Elder wrote about half human, half fish creatures that he called Nereids. Hmm, that sounds like uh, mermaids, avatar, I don't even know, Atlanteans. He even added to his first observation detailing that the human parts of said body were covered in rough scales. Human in appearance, but still fishy nonetheless. Awesome. Guess we have those to look forward to? The Elder also recalls a seaman who would climb ships at night and then sink them. Kind of like Aquaman, only he wouldn't help people. He would actually put them in life-threatening situations. But still cool, he probably looked like a bad climb on that ship, you know? Number nine, sirens, AKA mermaids. Here we go, figured I'd talk about these ones as well. The mythology surrounding sirens, it's interesting, but I don't know how I feel about it yet. We have to talk about it in the comments. I don't think we have Atlanteans flirting with sailors per se, but I do believe there's some sort of creature that's hybrid human fish, you know what I mean? On his first trip overseas in 1493, Christopher Columbus claims to have seen not one, but three sirens. Yeah, he even wrote about it. He said they rose well out of the sea, but they are not so beautiful as they are said to be. 
Okay, he's rhyming, that's always fun. Thank you, Columbus. For their faces had some masculine traits. That's what he added afterwards. I would think I'd be a very cute mermaid. Honestly, thank you so much. I could probably trick Christopher Columbus and be like, hey, come to this island. Just wave in and do my little fish thing, whatever. So what did Christopher Columbus see? I mean, when it comes to correctly identifying places and or people, obviously Chris can get confused. He's not really our go-to guy, I don't think anymore. So historians believe Columbus may have seen a few manatees and not mermaids. Either way, I'm like, you know what? Both are kind of terrifying to see out of nowhere. Number eight, the Kraken. For ages now, sailors from Norway and Greenland have shared tales of this giant sea monster, and you've probably heard about it as well. Or if you've seen the hit franchise, Pirates of the Caribbean, you've probably seen it in IMAX. Tentacles big enough to pluck you out of your boat. This thing is terrifying, right? We all know about the Kraken. In 1857, Danish naturalist Jephita Strinstrup found a large squid beak, and soon after was sent parts of another specimen from the Bahamas, okay? So something was out there. He concludes that the Kraken is real, and that this was proof, and that these parts were maybe part of a species of giant squid called Architeuthis dux, which translates to ruling squid in Latin. Very little is known about giant ruling squid, of course, because they're so hard to track, but we did get a photo of one in 2005 and a video of another in 2013. Number seven, Yellow Brick Road. Deep sea divers may have found the road to Atlantis, or Oz, one of the two. Back in May 2022, this bizarre path was spotted in the Pacific after an exploration vessel, Nautilus, caught the rocky formation near Hawaii. Just a nice place of unknown everything in that ocean. Awesome, we love exploring. The exploration team said in a recent interview with Wyon News that our corps of exploration have witnessed incredibly unique and fascinating geological formations while diving on the Lili Ukulani Ridge. The 90 degree fractures are most likely the results from, you know, a big eruption from a volcano a long, long time ago. The Marine National Monument, or PNMM for short, is the largest fully protected conservation area in the world. So let's, let's not litter anymore, maybe, I don't know. It covers more than 580,000 square miles in the ocean. So far we've only discovered 3% of its seafloor. So I'm sure there's many more discoveries of roads, apparently leading to Atlantis. Let's hope. Number six, the Great Lakes Griffin. Back in 2018 in Lake Michigan, Diver Steve Libert found what he believed was the holy grail of Great Lakes shipwrecks. Now, this is exciting to some. I can't even look at photos. I have thalassophobia. The Griffin sank back in 1679. Divers have been searching for this beauty for a very long time. As a kid, Steve himself, Steve Libert, was talking about the shipwreck when his history teacher stopped and said, hey, who knows? Maybe one of you will find the Griffin. Imagine that your grade eight teacher tells you somebody will find a ship one day and that somebody was actually you. Yeah, at 76 years old, Steve discovered the wreck. It was 2018, but his research began 40 years ago. Liber began diving back in 1981 after an amazing teacher got him motivated. It took a long time to track down, of course, but I think it was worth it, we can all agree. If you're in any Great Lakes, keep your eyes open for, you know, 50 foot long sh ships from the 1600s. They're always lurking below. That's why I can't swim. Like I put goggles on, look down, and see the top of a ship. I would throw up, I would literally, that's it. Maybe because I'm like afraid of heights and for some reason when I'm in like the ocean or like a lake, I feel like I'm up high. Maybe that's what it is. Number five, toxic waste. Okay, we mentioned a yellow brick road. It's always fun, it's a fun time, a creepy looking discovery, but certainly not harmful like this next one here. Yeah, for the back nine, we're gonna crank it up a bit. Sometimes we find literal barrels of waste. This dump site here was discovered off the coast of LA. It's 3,000 feet deep and these ROVs, these deep ROVs found around 27,000 barrels of waste. Looks like the climax of a Breaking Bad finale. It's just, what is going on down here? What happened? Who put these here? The 2021 discovery was deemed staggering. Yeah, that's one of many words I can say on YouTube, for sure. You can literally see in these photos like this aura of toxic waste, like just a, a plume of evil coming from these barrels. That's brutal. Recycle, please. Number four, the frilled shark. Also alarming, just in its own natural, terrifying way. Back in 2004, marine biologists discovered a dinosaur. Yeah, they discovered the frilled shark. It was lurking around 870 meters below the surface. Now this one looks like an eel, almost. It's so scary, I don't know. Frilled sharks can grow up to seven feet long, and they fight like daredevil. They can hunt in complete darkness. They don't have to look. They just use their senses, and they don't use sunlight. I almost got lost there while I was doing that bit, but if I was a frilled shark, I'd be dead on still, I'd be fine. They don't need to see anything, so remember that next time you're skinny dipping. Unless you can hold your breath for a long time, you won't actually run into the frilled shark, so don't worry about that. They're only found a mile below the surface, and again, they're rare as hell. 
Have you ever dealt one of these? Are you a diver? Have you seen a shark? Comment down below some of your diving nightmares, just so I can read them and then go, oh, I'm never going in the ocean ever again. That's what I like doing. I like going, oh, I'm never doing that ever again. That's what Reddit's for. Number three, the deepest shipwreck. The USS Johnston was a US Navy destroyer which sank during the Battle of Samar back in 1944. It was after a battle with a large fleet of Japanese warships and it went down. Now, Victor Vescavo, who was one of the few people who has made the dive into the Marianas Trench, that's why his name sounds familiar, he was one of the people who first stumbled upon the remains of this sunken warship. The ship's remains were first found in 2019 and was known as the deepest known shipwreck as it was found 6,456 meters deep in the Philippine Sea in the Pacific Ocean. I lost track of what I was saying. That's, it's so deep, I can't even imagine. That's like a mountain, you know what I'm saying? We have a new record holder, believe it or not. Yeah, the world's deepest shipwreck was discovered four miles underwater in the Philippines. Yep, this is now the world's deepest shipwreck that was ever discovered. This is terrifying. Uh, I wanna move on right now, I'm gonna throw up. Number two, loud ocean heat. This is just naturally and so scary, here we go. How depressing is this one? Okay, back in 1991, scientists lowered these massive speakers, like nightclub subwoofers, almost, into the waters at Heard Island. Also, like Heard Island speakers, is this a bit? I wish I was making this up. They made the pun for me. They did my job, I'm upset. These speakers emitted low frequency sounds all across our oceans. Now these signals were later picked up by receivers near California and Bermuda. And these signals contain information on the temperature of our oceans. Our oceans absorb more than 90% of energy left from global warming. Doesn't help when we lower 27,000 barrels of into it. So let's just maybe stop that for a bit. There were a few scientists who at the time were also concerned about how these low frequency sounds may be affecting our ocean life. Yeah, what does that sound like to a beluga whale? And finally, number one, the Vasa shipwreck. Back in 1628, the Vasa sunk within 20 minutes of setting sail. This is a tragedy. This claimed the lives of 30 souls on board. How tragic is this? Now, the Swedish Navy launched the ship August 10th, 1628. It was once considered a high-tech warship, even referred to as spectacular. So what the hell happened? Well, the first rush of wind caught it off guard, started making a little topsy-turny, and the second gush of wind sank it. Just like that, there was no war, there was nothing going on just a bottle of clink and then it went down so fast. It's like the scene in Shrek where it sinks fast comedically, but this was real life, so it wasn't comedic at all. It was actually rather terrifying. There was a crowd around and everything to send it off, but the 64 bronze cannons that were installed during the rushed process of building the warship, they were deemed too heavy, evidently. The lack of oxygen in the water allowed for its rediscovery to continue its story. That's how we know how she went down. The Vasa was built with carvings all around the king at the time, King Gustav II. So so when the wreck was discovered in 1961, 95% of the wood was still intact. It's deep, dark, and cold. Yeah, nothing really, uh, nothing affects it. Humans focusing too much on naval warfare, rather on if the ship can actually stay afloat. That's a, definitely a human problem. I can't tell if this is a curse or just humans being humans, but yeah, stop installing 64 bronze cannons. Number 10, the SSL Pharaoh. 15,000 feet below the surface of the Bermuda Triangle sits the SS El Faro, a 790-foot-long cargo ship. The story is tragic, but the mystery of where its crew ended up remains a mystery to this day. Did they succumb to the elements or something else? In September 2015, the Faro was set to pass right through the Bermuda Triangle while traveling from Florida to Puerto Rico. The ship was carrying 33 people in total. A tropical storm was brewing, but it was hundreds of miles away from the actual ship's route, and the cargo ship was built to withstand this kind of weather even if it did. But Mother Nature had other plans, and the storm transformed into a Category 3 hurricane with waves 40 feet high. The last message received from the ship said that the engine failed along with the power and that the entire ship had tilted on its side, but the crew had managed to contain the flooding and that things were for the most part under control. But that was the last message they received until a few weeks later when the El Faro was found sitting upright in Davy Jones' locker. Debris was everywhere, but there wasn't a single sign of the crew, their bodies nowhere to be seen. Number 9, the USS Cyclops. It's such a shame this ship had to go down carrying such an epic name. It was World War I, and Lieutenant G. W. Worley was sent on the dangerous task of carrying coal to Brazil to refuel Allied ships. With 309 people on board, the ship did reach Barbados in March, but after that, nothing. The USS Cyclops was never heard from again. The Navy's official statement reads, 
The disappearance of this ship has been one of the most baffling mysteries in the annals of the Navy, all attempts to locate her having proved unsuccessful. There were no enemy submarines in the Western Atlantic at that time and in December 1918 every effort was made to obtain from German sources information regarding the disappearance of this vessel. How do 309 people in a massive ship go missing without a trace? One secret the Bermuda Triangle aims to keep. Number 8 Flight 19 the year 1945. On December 5th, five Avenger torpedo bombs. I know I got excited too, but unfortunately unrelated to Marvel. Under the command of Lieutenant Charles Taylor from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, set out with 13 student pilots. Guess what happened? They disappeared. But it got super weird before they did. About an hour and a half into the flight, Taylor radioed that something was going wrong with their compasses, that they weren't working. He thought they were over the Florida Keys and so was told to head north, but Taylor got confused and the team kept heading out to sea. Night fell and before long all communication with the 13 petered out and the entire crew disappeared without a trace. To this day the planes have never been recovered and remained trapped beneath the waves of the Bermuda Triangle. Number 7 Piper Navajo The temperatures were ideal, the sky was clear, it was warm. There really shouldn't have been a problem, but for Irving Rivers, the secret of what happened to him that day will remain with him wherever he is. On November 3rd, 1978, Rivers left St. Croix, one of the US Virgin Islands, in his plane called the Piper Navajo. He was piloting for Eastern Caribbean Airways and was an extremely experienced pilot. While making a solo flight to pick up passengers, the control tower operator told him to avoid a spot of showers and Rivers made the adjustment. This is where it gets weird. The controller saw the lights of his plane and cleared him for landing, like he saw them glowing in the sky. But soon after another plane departed, Rivers lights completely disappeared. The red and green lights he saw blinking before were nowhere in sight and even stranger, his plane disappeared on the radar. An emergency search went out but nothing, they found absolutely nothing. This dudes plane literally disappeared 1.6 kilometers from landing and nothing, no trace, no debris, nothing was found. Number 6 The Witchcraft I wouldn't be surprised if there was some kind of magic involved with the Bermuda Triangle, but witchcraft was actually the name of the ship. On December 22nd, a 23 foot long luxury yacht crewed by two gentlemen, Dan Brack and Father Patrick Horgan, went out to enjoy a dazzling Christmas view of Miami. But then a mile offshore, the yacht radioed that they'd hit something but there didn't appear to be damage. They asked to be towed ashore anyway and the coast guard set out immediately. It took them 20 minutes to reach the site but when they got there, there was nothing. They knew that aboard the craft there were tons of flares, life vests, lifeboats, and distress signal devices including a special design installed by Barack. He put an extra flotation device designed in such a way that even if the hull was ruptured, a part of the ship would still be able to float. But there was no sign that the ship had even been there. They searched 1200 square miles but still nothing. Number 5 The Mystery of the Derelict The Ellen Austin was a white oak schooner that was sailing from New York to London in 1881, but a discovery they made during their voyage stopped them in their tracks. A derelict ship was seen floating aimlessly near the Bermuda Triangle. Captain Baker, captain of the Ellen, waited two days before approaching it just in case it was a trap. When he hopped aboard he found no sign of any crew though it was well packed and fully stocked. In order to tow it back, the captain placed a crew on the ship so they could sail it back together. But as they tried to do just that, a storm hit, separating them. After it cleared, Baker saw the ship drifting once again and chased it down. But just like how he'd found it, the ship was entirely crewless. Not a sign of the men he had placed on there was found. They abandoned the ship fearing that whatever was on it was cursed. Number 4 The Ghost Ship of the Outer Banks If you love that show, I know what you thought of. To earn a name like that, something crazy must have happened, and that it did. A massive schooner known as the Carol A. Deering was discovered completely abandoned by the Coast Guard and has ghost story written all over it. While returning from Hampton Roads, Virginia, from Barbados on January 29th, 1921, she passed the Cape Lookout Lightship. The officer reported that the crew seemed disorganized and confused, but the crew reported that they had lost their anchors. The last time the ship would be seen was by another ship, the SS Lake Elon, who said the Deering looked like it was heading a weird direction. 
At 6.30 a.m. on January 31st, the ship was seen run aground on the shoals with the decks awash, sails set, lifeboats missing and therefore seemingly abandoned. But all personal belongings were left behind including navigational equipment, crucial papers and there was indeed no anchor on the ship. The weirdest thing though was the food laid out as if someone was in the middle of preparing food. Rumors of rum running and even pirates surrounding the wreckage but no one has ever solved the mystery of their disappearance. Number 3 Star Tiger The Star Tiger was supposed to arrive at 5am in Bermuda but as you can guess that never happened. In fact this would be the last flight it would ever take. Captain B. W. McMillan was flying with World War II hero Air Marshal Sir Arthur Conningham on January 30th 1948 from England to Bermuda. The Star Tiger was a British South American Airways Tudor 4 plane. Official records state that the aircraft's heater was unreliable and may have failed or that the compass was at fault. But as for what actually happened that must lie with whatever natural anomalies surrounded that area. McMillan decided to fly at around 2,000 feet which is pretty low but he was trying to avoid the strong wind due to the Gulf Stream in the area. The last time they reported their position was at 3.15 am and they were on track to arrive at 5 am but they never showed up. Now flying so low meant they would have little room to maneuver and burn fuel faster. So perhaps it was due to natural events that something happened but when it comes to the Bermuda Triangle who can be sure? Number 2 The Star Ariel Similar to the Star Tiger, the Star Ariel was another Tudor 4 model and a part of the British South American Airways. It was after this flight however that the model was discontinued. It left Heathrow Airport for the first time in 1946 with 7 crew members and 13 passengers en route to Jamaica. They were just going on holiday. People just looking for a good time. Captain J.C. McPhee reported in that things were going smoothly. So far so good. But then a cryptic message arrived where the captain said he was changing his frequency and then the sound cut out. Nothing was heard after that. When the craft didn't arrive a search party was sent out but not even a hint of debris or wreckage was ever found. With two of these aircrafts disappearing in such a mysterious way it's no wonder they got rid of the Tudor 4 with so much bad luck clearly. Might have been cursed. Number one, last but not least, the Tynemouth Electron. What can money, an aggressive PR assistant, and a boat buy you? Well, for Donald Crownhurst, he thought it would crown him a winner of the Sunday Times Golden Globe race, an event that required each contestant to sail around the world alone. Thing is, he was pretty new to sailing. But with a substantially large financial backer, Crowhurst had a lot riding on this adventure. He set sail from London on October 3rd, 1968 but almost turned back after his boat started having some problems. He decided to man a Tremarin. Unfortunately it was poorly built and the new improvements Crowhurst made fell apart like paper in water. But nevertheless he kept calm and carried on, even reporting to his publicist that he was having a grand old time. Thing is he never left the Atlantic. This is his route compared to the others. On his return he feared that his deceptions would be revealed so he jumped ship. His ship the Electron was abandoned in the Bermuda Triangle in July 1969 and many suspect that the unusual energy of the area is what drew the man to madness. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have the Godzilla shark. With a name like that this creature is surely anything but disappointing. About 300 million years ago these guys ruled the sea and were one of the most terrifying sea creatures ever on our planet. Fossils of these guys have been found in the Manzano Mountains which lie east of Albuquerque, New Mexico and they were found in 2013 by paleontologist John Paul Hodnett. So think of a massive shark, but now picture it covered in scales, like a reptile. Okay, now add 12 rows of super sharp teeth and also the largest dorsal fin spines of any shark that has ever lived. Okay, now you've pretty much got the Godzilla shark. It was nicknamed the Godzilla shark because of its size as the skeleton is the largest fossil of its kind ever discovered in the area as well as the fact that its fin spines are so intriguing to look at. While it was called the Godzilla shark upon its discovery it has since received a more official name of Hoffman's dragon shark both to honor the family that owned the land where the skeleton was found and as an homage to its monstrous and reptilian appearance. In our number 9 spot today we have the Shastasaurus. This extinct genus of Ichthyosaurus is one of the largest marine reptiles known, growing to be 21 meters long. One of the most interesting things about these guys is that they were quick
quite specialized because they had quite a wild food preference. These guys had a thirst for squid. A study of their fossils revealed that they had short snouted skulls, which has led experts to believe that their jaws had the ability to open extremely quickly and very wide. This happened so fast it created a sort of vacuum inside of their mouth, sucking in anything that was in front of it. These guys didn't bother with teeth or strong jaws, they didn't need a crazy bite force or really to even move that quickly. They basically just needed to swim over to wherever their desired squid was hanging out and uh, open their mouth. In our number eight spot today, we have the Dunkleosteus. Dunkle Dunkleosteus. I don't know, man. This creature was a genus of Plasoderm, which is a class of fish that has been extinct for around 360 million years. These ancient swimmers had osteoderms, which means that they had these plates of exposed bone that served as protection. It's like a built in armor. These guys were some of the largest and most powerful Plasoderms ever, and it had a terrifying ability that made it quite a worthy predator. It was their insanely powerful bite force, which has been estimated to be about seven. 750 kilograms. That's wild. This has led experts to believe that these guys may have been a hyper carnivore, which means that they were feeding on some pretty tough prey. Other creatures that have outer protection like they do. Ammonites, they were able to chew through some pretty tough exteriors. In our number seven spot today, we have the Mausaurus. These guys are a creature that was once very real, but they are thankfully a relic of our past because they are absolutely horrifying. They are named after the Maori god Maui, who is said to have pulled the islands of New Zealand up from the sea floor, so anything named after him is of course going to be an absolutely ginormous beast. The neck of this creature measured around 49 feet long, which is the longest proportionate neck of any animal. The entire creature measured around 66 feet long, so it's clear that their neck counted for a very large portion of their body. But like, imagine a swimming dinosaur creature with a huge snake for a neck. That's kind of what these guys were like. These guys lived on Earth during the Cretaceous period, which is good news for us, but not so much for the creatures that lived at that time. Creatures would jump into the water to avoid a T-Rex only to find this guy waiting for them. Yeah. No thank you. In our number 6 spot today we have the Helicorprion. This animal existed somewhere around 250 million years ago, and while it looks more like a shark than anything else, scientists now know it was actually a creature that is related more closely to chimeras, which are a fish that separated from the shark family about 400 million years ago. So why is this animal just scary and terrible to look at? Well, that is due to the incredibly unsettling spiral saw formation of teeth that this creature had right on their lower jaw. Yeah, an orthodontist's dream, truly. It's also not like this creature was just born with the teeth that they had for the rest of their lives. No, of course not. They had teeth that could grow and new teeth could even form. Imagine being in the ocean and you see a huge creature swim up to you that has four spiral saws for teeth. No. In our number five spot today, we have the Megalodon. Is any terrifying prehistoric sea creatures list truly complete without an appearance from the Meg? Megalodons are one of the largest sharks to have ever existed. They were huge, they were terrifying, they were apex predators, and they are the creatures that inspired the tales of Jaws, or the Meg. The teeth on these sharks are so large that they are three times larger than the teeth of a modern great white shark. With a teeth that size, you can only imagine how large this shark would have been. It's pretty tough to figure out exactly why the Megalodon died out. I mean, they were one of the largest, scariest creatures who shouldn't have had any trouble finding food, but that might not be the case. Some believe it was the cooling water, others believe it was the competition for food, whatever the case in the end, while the Megalodon is an incredible creature in history, I think we can probably all breathe a sigh of relief that they aren't currently swimming around our oceans. Or are they? In our number four spot today, we have Cretoxyrena. Measuring about seven meters long, these creatures aren't necessarily the largest on this list full of prehistoric giants, but that does not mean it is any less terrifying. Fossil evidence has shown us that these creatures were ready to attack just about anything and everything that ended up in front of them. It could be a four meter long fish, a marine reptile like a mosasaur, or even a large turtle, it doesn't matter. The key to what made these guys so incredibly ferocious is their special teeth. 
teeth. Their teeth adapted to have a much thicker enamel, which meant that they were exceptionally resilient. This is perfect when you're trying to cut through shells and bones. These teeth are actually what landed these guys with the nickname of the Jinsu shark, which is named after the famous commercial for Jinsu knives, which are shown slicing through metal cans. In our number three spot today, we have the Jacolopterus. Okay, I've got three words for you. Giant sea scorpion. Yeah, I'm not going in the prehistoric ocean. This eight foot long arthropod lived in the water with its gross, too large pincers and claws, and honestly, it looks like something out of the movie Alien. These guys had segmented bodies, and they are actually the largest known arthropod to have ever existed here on Earth. They had multiple specialized limbs, and some of them even had spikes. Like, for example, their 18 inch spiked claw that was used to snatch fish as it passed by. It is said that some of these guys would crawl out of the water in order to mate and sometimes shed their outer skin. And all I have to say about that is imagine finding an eight foot long molt of one of these creatures on the beach right before going in for a swim. You wouldn't, right? I'd swear off all water after that. I'm not even drinking it anymore. I don't want any part of what these guys got going on. In our number two spot today, we have the Tylosaurus. These creatures belong to the family of Mosasaurs, and they have long eel-like bodies that allowed them to smoothly cruise through the waters. They had the ability to have intense bursts of speed that propelled them to their prey, which they could quickly take down. The snout of these creatures is thought to have been quite large and rather robust compared to other species of Mosasaurs, which has led researchers to believe that they may have used it to their advantage. To do this, they might have rammed into larger prey so that they were stunned. This gave them time to turn around and finish the prey with their large jaws. Despite these specialized skills, it seems as though these guys weren't very picky with what they ate, as they have been found with all kinds of remains in their stomach area. These creatures were very large, but they were also way faster and more agile compared to their family members. What more could you want in a pre historic predator. In our number one spot today, we have the Leeds fish. This is a fish that lived in the oceans of our world from the middle to the late Jurassic. They are the largest ray finned fish and among the largest fish that are known to have ever existed. The discovery of these fish has been a bit troublesome because of the fact that their skeletons aren't completely made of bone. There were large parts of them made of cartilage which did not fossilize. Because of this, it is difficult to estimate their true size with estimates in the past ranging as large is 30 meters or 98 feet. More recent research, however, has lowered this number to the still exceptionally large measurement of 16 meters or 52 feet. Despite their large size, however, these fish weren't terrifying apex predators and instead were a part of a lineage of large filter feeders. These fish had gill arches that were lined with gill rakers, which had quite a unique system of bone plates that allowed them to filter the plankton from the seawater, which was their main source of food. 